Welcome, everyone. I am Jeremiah, and this is TensorFlow in production. I'm excited that you're all here, because that means you're excited about production. And that means you're building things that people actually use. So our talk today has three parts. I want to start by quickly drawing a thread that kind of connects all of them. Uh, and the first thread is the origin of these projects. These projects really come from our teams that are on the front line of machine learning. So these are real problems that we've come across doing machine learning at Google scale. And these are the real solutions that let us do machine learning at Google. The second thing I want to talk about is this observation. Um, if we look at software engineering over the years, we see this growth. As we discover new tools, as we discover best practices, we're really getting more effective at doing, machine, or doing software engineering. And we're getting more efficient. We're seeing the same kind of growth on the machine learning side. Right? We're discovering new best practices and new tools. The catch is that this growth is maybe 10 or 15 years behind software engineering. Um, and we're also rediscovering a lot of the same things that exist in software engineering, but in a machine learning context. So we're doing things like discovering version control for machine learning, or continuous integration for machine learning. So I think it's worth keeping that in mind as we move through the talks. The first one up is going to be TensorFlow Hub. And this is something that lets you share reusable pieces of machine learning, much the same way we share code. Then we'll talk a little bit about deploying machine learning models with TensorFlow Serving. And we'll finish up with TensorFlow Extended, which wraps a lot of these things together in a platform to increase your velocity as a machine learning practitioner. So with that, I'd like to hand it over to Andrew to talk about TensorFlow Hub. Thanks, Jeremiah. Hi, everybody. I'm Andrew Gasparovich. And uh, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about TensorFlow Hub, which is a new library that's designed to bring reusability to machine learning. So software repositories have been a real benefit to developer productivity over the past 10 or 15 years. And they're great, first of all, because when you're writing something new, uh, if you have a repository, you think, oh, maybe I'll check whether there's something that already exists and reuse that rather than starting from scratch. Um, but a second thing that happens is you start thinking, maybe I'll write my code in a way that's specifically designed for reuse, which is great because it makes your code more modular, but it also has the potential to benefit a whole community if you share that code. What we are doing with TensorFlow Hub is bringing that idea of a repository to machine learning. In this case, TensorFlow Hub is designed so that you can create, share, and reuse components of ML models. And if you think about it, it's even more important to have a repository for machine learning, even more so than software development, because in the case of machine learning, not only are you reusing the algorithm and the expertise, but you're also reusing potentially enormous amount of compute power that went into training the model and all of the training data as well. So all four of those, the algorithm, the training data, the compute, and the expertise, all go into a module, which is shareable with TensorFlow Hub. And then you can import those into your model. And those models, uh, those modules are pre-trained. So they have the weights and the TensorFlow graph inside. And unlike a model, they're designed to be composable, which means that you can put them together like building blocks and add your own stuff on top. They're reusable, which means that they have common signatures so that you can swap one for another. And they're retrainable, which means that you can actually backpropagate through uh, a module that you've inserted into your graph. 
So let's take a quick look at an example. Uh, in this case, we'll do a little bit of image classification. Let's say that we want to make an, an app to classify rabbit breeds from photos. But we only have a few hundred example photos, probably not enough to build a whole image classifier from scratch. But what we could do is start from a general purpose model, and we could take the reusable part of it, the architecture and the weights there, take off the classification, and then we could add our own classifier on top and train it with our own examples. We'll keep that reusable part fixed, and we'll train our own classifier on top. So if you're using TensorFlow Hub, you start at tensorflow.org slash hub, where you can find a whole bunch of newly released, state-of-the-art, research-oriented, and the well-known image modules. Some of them are, uh, cl include classification, and some of them chop off the cl classification layers and just output feature vectors. So that's what we want in our own case, in this case, because we're going to add uh, classification on top. So maybe we'll choose um, NASNet, which is a, uh, an image module that was created by a neural architecture search. So we'll choose NASNet A, the large version, with the feature vectors. So we just paste the URL for the module into our um, TF Hub code. And then we're ready to use that module just like a function. In between, the module gets downloaded and instantiated into your graph. So all you have to do is get those feature vectors, add your own classification on top, and output the, um, the new categories. So specifically what we're doing is training just the classification part while keeping all of the module's weights fixed. But the great thing about reusing a module is that you get all of the uh, training and compute that's gone into um, that reusable portion. So in the case of NASNet, it was over 62,000 GPU hours that went into finding the architecture and training the model, plus all of the expertise, the testing, um, and the research that went into NASNet. You're reusing all of that in that one line of uh, code. And as I mentioned before, those modules are uh, trainable. So if you have enough data, you can do fine tuning with the module. If you set that trainable parameter to true and you select that you want to use the training graph, what you'll end up doing is training the entire thing along with your classification. The caveat being that, of course, you have to lower the learning rate uh, so that you don't ruin the weights inside the module. But if you have enough training data, it's something that you can do to get even better accuracy. And in general, we have lots of image modules on TF Hub. We have ones that are straight out of research papers like NASNet. We have ones that are great for production, and even ones made for on-device usage like MobileNet, plus all of the industry standard ones that people are familiar with like Inception and uh, ResNet. So let's look at one more example, in this case doing a little bit of text classification. We'll do, uh, look at some restaurant reviews and decide whether they're positive or negative sentiment. And one of the great things about TF Hub is that all of those modules, because they're TensorFlow graphs, you can include things like pre-processing. So the text modules that are available on TF Hub take whole sentences and phrases, not just individual words, because they have all of the tokenization and pre-processing uh, stored in the graph itself. So we'll use one of those, and basically the same idea. We're going to select a sentence embedding module, we'll add our own classification on top, and we'll train it with our own data. But we'll keep the module itself fixed. And just like before, we'll start by going to tensorflow.org slash hub and uh, take a look at the text modules that are available. In this case, maybe we'll choose the universal sentence encoder, which is uh, just recently released um, based on a research paper from last month 
the idea is that it was trained on a variety of tasks and is specifically meant to support using it with a variety of tasks. And it also takes just a very small amount of training data to uh, use it in your model, which is perfect for our uh, example case. So we'll use that universal sentence encoder. And just like before, we'll paste the URL into our code. The difference here is we're using it with a text embedding column. That way, we can feed it into one of the uh, high-level TensorFlow estimators, in this case, the DNN classifier. Uh, but you could also use that module, it, like I showed in the earlier example, calling it just as a function. If you are using the text embedding column, that also, uh, just like in the other example, can be trained as well. And just like in the other example, it's something that you can do with a lower learning rate if you have a lot of training data, and it may give you better accuracy. And so um, we have a lot of text modules available on TF Hub. We actually just added three new languages to the NNLM modules, Chinese, Korean, and Indonesian. Those are all trained on uh, GNU's training data. And we also have a uh, really great module called ELMO from some recent research, which understands words in context. Uh, and of course, the universal sentence encoder, as I talked about. So just to show you for a minute some of those URLs that we've been looking at, um, maybe we'll take apart the pieces here. tfhub.dev is our new source for um, Google and selected partner published modules. In this case, this is Google that's the publisher, and the universal sentence encoder is the name of the module. The one at the end is a version number. So TensorFlow Hub considers um, modules to be immutable. And so the version number is there so that if you're you know, doing one training run and then another, you don't have a situation where the, the module chain changes unexpectedly. So all modules on tfhub.dev are versioned that way. And one of the nice things about those URLs, if you paste them into a browser, uh, you get the module documentation. The idea being that maybe you read a new paper, you see, oh, there's a URL for a TF Hub module in it. You paste it into your browser. You see the documentation. You paste it into some code. And in one line, you're able to use that module and try out the new research. And speaking of the uh, universal encoder, the team just released a new light version, which is a much smaller size. It's about 25 megabytes. And it's specifically designed for uh, cases where the full text module wouldn't work for doing things like on-device classification. Also today, we released a new module from DeepMind. This one, uh, you can feed in video, and it will classify and detect the actions in that video. So in this case, it correctly guesses the video is of people playing cricket. And of course, we also have um, a number of other interesting modules. There's a generative image module, which is trained on Celeb A. Uh, it has a progressive GAN inside. And also the deep local features module, which um, can identify the key points of landmark images. Those are all available now on TF Hub. And last but not least, I wanted to mention that we just announced our support for TensorFlow.js. So using the TensorFlow.js converter, you can directly convert a TF Hub module into a format that can be used on the web. It's uh, a really simple integration to be able to take a module and use it in the web browser with TensorFlow.js. And we're really excited to see what you build with it. So just to summarize, TensorFlow Hub is designed to be a starting point for reusable machine learning. And the idea is, just like with a software repository, before you start from scratch, check out what's available on TensorFlow Hub. And you may find that it's better to start with a module and import that into your model 
rather than starting the task completely from scratch. We have a lot of modules available, and we're adding more all the time. And uh, we're really excited to see what you build. So thanks. Next up is Jeremiah to talk about TF Serving. All right. Thank you, Andrew. So next is TensorFlow Serving. This is going to be how we deploy modules, or deploy models, just to get a sense for where this falls in the machine learning process. Right? We start with our data. We use TensorFlow to train a model in the output, our artifact there. Are these models, right? These are saved models. It's a graphical representation of the, the data flow. And once we have those, we want to share them with the world. That's where TensorFlow Serving comes in. It's this big orange box. So this is something that takes our models and exposes them to the world through a service so clients can make requests. TensorFlow Serving will take them, run the inference, run the model, come up with an answer, and return that in a response. So TensorFlow Serving is actually the libraries and binaries. You need to do this to do this production grade inference over trained TensorFlow models. Uh, it's written in C++ and supports things like gRPC and plays nicely with Kubernetes. So to do this well, it has a couple of features. The first and most important is it supports multiple models. So on one TensorFlow model server, you can load multiple models, right? And just like most folks probably wouldn't push a new binary right to production, you don't want to push a new model right to production either. So having these multiple models in memory lets you be serving one model on production traffic and load a new one and maybe send it some canary requests, send it some QA requests, make sure everything's all right, and then move the traffic over to that new model. And this supports doing things like reloading. If you have a stream of models you're producing, TensorFlow Serving will transparently load the new ones and unload the old ones. We've built in a lot of isolation. Um, if you have a model that's serving a lot of traffic in one thread, and it's time to load a new model, we make sure to do that in a separate thread. That way, we don't cause any hiccups in the thread that's serving production traffic. And again, this entire system has been built from the ground up to be very high throughput. Things like selecting those different models based on the name or selecting different versions. That's very, very efficient. Similarly, it has some advanced batching. Right? This way, we can make use of accelerators. We also see improvements on standard CPUs with this batching. Um, and then lots of other enhancements, everything from protocol buffer magic um, to lots more. And this is really what we use inside Google to serve TensorFlow. I think there's over 1,500 projects that use it. It serves somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 million QPS which ends up being about 100 million items predicted per second. And we're also seeing some adoption outside of Google. One of the new things I'd like to share today is distributed serving. So looking inside Google, we've seen a couple of trends. One is that models are getting bigger and bigger. Some of the ones inside Google are over a terabyte in size. The other thing we're seeing is this sharing of subgraphs, right? TF Hub is producing these common pieces of models. And we're also seeing more and more specialization in these models as they get bigger and bigger, right? If you look at some of these model structures, they look less like a model that would belong on one machine and more like an entire system. So that's, this is exactly what distributed serving is meant for. Kind of lets us take the single model and basically break it up into microservices. So to get a better feel for that, we'll say that Andrew has taken his rabbit classifier and is serving it on a model server. And we'll say that I want to create a similar system to classify cat breeds. And so I've done the same thing. I've started from TensorFlow Hub. So you can see I've got the TensorFlow Hub module in the center there. And you'll notice that since we both started from the same module, we have the same bits of code. We have the same core to our machine learned model. So what we can do is we can start a third server, and we can put the TensorFlow Hub module on that server. And we can remove it 
from the servers on the outside and leave in its place this placeholder we call a remote op. You can think of this as a portal. It's kind of a forwarding op that when we run the inference, it forwards at the appropriate point in the, in the processing to the model server. There, the computation is done, and the result gets sent back. And the computation continues on our classifiers on the outside. So there's a few reasons we might want to do this, right? We can get rid of some duplication. Now we only have one model server loading all these weights. Um, we also get the benefit that that can batch requests that are coming from both sides. And also, we can set up different configurations. You can imagine we might have this model server just loaded with TPUs, our tensor processing units, so that it can do um, what are most likely convolutional operations and things like that very efficiently. So another place where we use this is with large sharded models. So if you're familiar with deep learning, there's this technique of embedding things like words or YouTube video IDs um, as a string of numbers, right? We represent them as this vector of numbers. And if you have a lot of words or you have a lot of YouTube videos, you're going to have a lot of data, so much that it won't fit on one machine. So we use a system like this to split up those embeddings for the words um, into these shards, and we can distribute there. And of course, the main model, when it needs something, can reach out, get it, and then do the computation. Another example is what we call triggering models. So we'll say we are building a spam detector. And we have a full model, which is a very, very powerful spam detector. You know, maybe it looks at the words, understands the context. It's very powerful, but it's very expensive. And we can't afford to run it on every single email message we get. So what we do instead is we put this triggering model in front of it. As you can imagine, there's a lot of cases where we're in a position to very quickly say, yes, this is spam, or no, it's not. So for instance, if we get an email that's from within our own domain, you know, maybe we can just say, that's not spam. And the triggering model can quickly return that. If it's something that's difficult, it can go ahead and forward that on to the full model where it will process it. So a similar concept is this mixture of experts. So in this case, let's say we want to build a system where we're going to classify the breed of either a rabbit or a cat. So what we're going to do is we're going to have two models we're going to call expert models. Right? So we have one that's an expert at rabbits and another that's an expert at cats. And so here, we're going to use a gating model to get a picture of either a rabbit or cat. And the only thing it's going to do is decide if it's a rabbit or a cat and forward it on to the appropriate expert who will process it, and we'll send that, that result back. All right, there's lots of use cases. We're excited to see what uh, people start to build with these remote ops. Um, the next thing I'll quickly mention is a REST API. This was one of the top requests on GitHub, so we're happy to be releasing this soon. This will make it much easier to integrate things with existing, uh, existing services. And it's nice because you don't actually have to choose. On one model server with one TensorFlow model, you can serve either the RESTful endpoint or the gRPC. There's three APIs. There's some higher level ones, like for classification and regression. There's also a lower level predict. And this is more of a tensor in, tensor out for the things that don't fit into classify and regress. So looking at this quickly, uh, you can see the URI here. We can specify the model. right? This may be like rabbit or cat. Uh, we can optionally specify a version. And our verbs are the classify, regress, and predict. We have two examples. The first one, you can see we're asking the iris model to classify something. And here, we aren't giving it a version, a uh, model version. So it'll just use the most recent or the highest version automatically. And the bottom example is one where we're using the MNIST model, and we're specifying the version to be 3.1.4 and asking it to do a prediction. So this lets you, this lets you easily integrate things um, and easily version models and switch between them. 
I'll quickly mention the API. If you're familiar with TensorFlow example, you know that representing it in JSON is a little bit cumbersome. So you can see it's pretty verbose here. There's some other warts, like needing to encode things in base64. Instead, with TensorFlow serving, the RESTful API uses a more idiomatic JSON, which is much more pleasant, much more succinct. And here, this last example just kind of pulls it all together, where you can use curl to actually make predictions uh, from the command line. So I encourage you to check out the project at TensorFlow Serving. There's lots of great documentation and things like that. And we also welcome contributions and code, discussion, ideas um, on our GitHub project page. So I'd like to finish with James to talk about TensorFlow Extended. Thanks. All right, so I'm going to start with a single non-controversial statement. Uh, this has been shown true many, many times by many people. Uh, in short, TFX is our answer to that statement. I'll start with a simple diagram. Uh, this core box represents your machine learning code. Uh, this is the magic bits of algorithms that actually take the data in and produce reasonable results. The blue boxes represent everything else you need to actually use machine learning reliably and scalably in an actual real production setting. Uh, the blue boxes are going to be where you're spending most of your time. It comprises most of the lines of code. And it's also going to be the source of most of the things that are setting off your pagers in the middle of the night. Uh, in our case, if we squint at this just about correctly, uh, the core ML box looks like TensorFlow. And all of the blue boxes together comprise TFX. So we're going to quickly run through four of the key principles that TFX was built on. Uh, first is flexibility. And TFX is going to be flexible in three ways. Uh, first of all, we're going to take advantage of the flexibility built into TensorFlow. Using it as our trainer means that we can do anything TensorFlow can do at the model level, which means you can have wide models, deep models, supervised models, unsupervised uh, tree models, anything that we can whip up together. Second, we're flexible with regards to input data. We can handle images, text, sparse data, multimodal models, where you might want to train images and surrounding text, or something like videos plus captions. Uh, third, there are multiple ways you might go about actually training a model. If your goal is to build a kitten detector, you may have all of your data up front, and your goal may be to build one model of sufficiently high quality, and then you're done. In contrast to that, if your goal is to build a viral kitten video detector or a personalized kitten recommender, then you're not going to have all of your data up front. So typically, you train a model, get it into production, and then as data comes in, you'll throw away that model and train a new model, and then throw away that model and train a new model. We're actually throwing out some good data along with these models, though, so we can try a worm starting strategy instead, where we'll continuously train the same model but as data comes in, we'll warm start based on the previous state of the model and just add the additional new data. This will let us re result in higher quality models with faster convergence. Next, let's talk about portability. So each of the TFX modules, represented by the blue boxes, don't need to do all of the heavy lifting themselves. They're part of an open source ecosystem which means we can lean on things like TensorFlow and take advantage of its native portability. This means we can run locally. We can scale up and run in a cloud environment. We can scale to devices that you're thinking about today and to devices that you might be thinking about tomorrow. A large portion of machine learning is data processing. So we rely on Apache Beam, which is built for this task. And again, we can take advantage of Beam's portability as our own, which means we can use the direct runner locally, where you might be starting out with a small piece of data, building small models to affirm that your approaches are actually correct, and then scale up into the cloud with a data flow runner. Also utilize something like the Flink runner, or things that are in progress right now, like a Spark runner. We'll see the same story again with Kubernetes, where we can start with Minikube running locally, scale up into the cloud or to clusters that we have for other purposes, and eventually scale to things that don't yet exist, but they're still in progress. 
So portability is only part of the scalability story. Uh, traditionally, we've seen two very different roles involved in machine learning. So you'll have the data scientists on one side and the production infrastructure engineers on the other side. The differences between these are not just amounts of data, but there are key concerns that each has about, as they go about their daily business. With TFX, we can specifically target use cases that are in common between the two, as well as things that are specific to the two. So this will allow us to have one unified system that can scale up to the cloud and down to smaller environments and actually unlock collaboration between these two roles. Finally, we believe heavily in interactivity. We should be able to get quick, iterative results with responsive tooling and fast debugging. And this interactivity should remain such, even at scale, with large sets of data or large models. So this is a fairly ambitious goal. So where are we now? So today, we've open sourced a few key areas of responsibility. So we have transform, model analysis, serving, and facets. Each one of these is useful on its own, but is much more so when used in concert with the others. So let's walk through what this might look like in practice. So our goal here is to take a bunch of data we've accumulated and do something useful for our users of our product. These are the steps we want to take along the way. So let's start with step one with the data. We're going to pull this up in facets and use it to actually analyze what features might be useful predictors, look for any anomalies, so outliers in our data or missing features, to try to avoid the classic garbage in, garbage out problem, and to try to inform what data we're going to need to further pre-process before it's useful for our ML training, which leads into our next step, which is to actually use transform to transform our features. So TF Transform will let you do full pass analysis and transforms of your base data. And it's also very firmly attached to the TF graph itself, which will ensure that you're applying the same transforms in training as in serving. From the code, you can see that we're taking advantage of a few ops built into Transform. And we could do things like scale, generate vocabularies, or bucketize our base data. And this code will look the same regardless of our execution environment. And of course, if you need to define your own operations, you can do so. So this puts us at the point where we're strongly suspicious that we have data we can actually use to generate a model. So let's look at doing that. We're going to use a TensorFlow estimator, which is a high-level API that will let us quickly define, train, and export our model. Uh, this is a small set of estimators that are present in Core TensorFlow. There are a lot more available, and you can also create your own. We're going to look ahead to some future steps, and we're going to purposefully export two graphs into our save model, one specific to serving and one specific to model evaluation. And again, from the code, you can see that we're going to, in this case, we're going to use a wide and deep model. We're going to define it, we're going to train it, and we're going to do our exports. So now we have a model. We could just push this directly to production, but that would probably be a very bad idea. So let's try to gain a little more confidence in what would happen if we actually did so for our end users. So we're going to step into TF model analysis. We're going to utilize this to evaluate our model over a large data set. And then we're going to define, in this case, uh, one, but you could possibly use many, uh, slices of this data that we want to analyze independently from others. This will allow us to actually look at subsets of our data that may be representative of subsets of our users and how our metrics actually track between these groups. For example, you may have sets of users in different languages, maybe access to different devices, or maybe you have a very small but passionate community of rabbit aficionados mixed in with your larger community of kitten fanatics. And you want to make sure that your model will actually give a positive experiences to both groups equally. So now we have a model that we're confident in, and we want to push it to serving. So let's get this up and throw some queries at it. So this is quick. Uh, now we have a model up. 
we have a server listening on port 9000 for gRPC requests. So now we're going to back out into our actual product code. We can assemble individual prediction requests, and then we can send them out to our server. And if this slide doesn't look like your actual code, and this one looks more similar, then you'll be happy to see that this is coming soon. I'm cheating a little by showing you this now as current state, but we're super excited about this, and this is one of those real soon now scenarios. So that's today. Uh, what's coming next? So first, uh, please contribute and join the TensorFlow.org community. We don't want the only time that we're talking back and forth here to be at summits and conferences. Uh, secondly, some of you may have seen the TFX paper at KDD last year. Uh, this specifies what we believe an end-to-end -end platform actually looks like. Uh, here it is. And by we believing that this is what it looks like, uh, this is what it looks like. This is actually what's powering some of the pretty awesome AI-first products that you've been seeing at I.O. and that you've probably been using yourselves. But again, this is where we are in OSS right now. Uh, this is not the full platform, but you can see what we're aiming for, and we'll get there eventually. So again, uh, please download this software, uh, use it to make good things, and send us feedback. And thank you from all of us for uh, being current and future users and for choosing to spend your time with us today.